I think we give us a second, and then I think we're going to get going. I think we have attendees on. So I want to welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Ross Goldberg. For those who don't know me, I am a past president and the current chair of the Legislative and Government Affairs uh, Committee for, for the Arizona Medical Association. Uh, I want to thank our panelists for being here today. I'm going to do a quick intro, introduce them, and then we're going to get right into it because we have much more talented people on to talk about this program, and you don't need to hear too much from me. So a little intro again on behalf of ARMA and our nearly 4,000 members across the state. Thank you again for all participating. We promote leadership in the art and science of medicine and advocate for economically sustainable medical practices, the freedom to deliver care in the best interest of patients and health for all Arizonans. Our organization has been the strongest voice for medicine in Arizona for the last 130 years. We are proud of our patient-centered approach to advocacy and our passion for advancing access to quality healthcare. With that in mind, ARMA is the most appropriate entity to convene a discussion on the 340B program. Briefly, the 340B is a critical program with an important mission to enable safety net providers to serve more uninsured patients. Congress first created the Medicaid Drug Rebate Program in 1990, which required pharmaceutical manufacturers to provide rebates for medications as a condition of having their products covered by Medicaid. The amount of the rebate paid to the states was based on a best price calculation that did not consider the discounted prices that manufacturers were already offering directly to clinics and public hospitals serving largely low income and uninsured patients. Congressional hearings in 1992 found that the failure to exempt these voluntary discounts under the Medicaid drug rebate program were causing prices in these facilities to rise dramatically, on average 32%, due to the size of the discounts previously offered. In response, Congress created the 340B program with strong bipartisan support. The program's success and its goal to serve vulnerable populations has led to significant growth and evolution over the last decade. This has in turn led to new challenges and policy questions among its stakeholders. On behalf of our physicians who need this program to succeed to, succeed to best serve our vulnerable patients, we hope to facilitate and elevate the conversation today. I am proud to introduce our panelists who are sure to have diverse perspectives on the program to give you an in-depth understanding of 340B's history, its benefits to our community, and its capacity for improvement in the future. So allow me to introduce our panelists now, starting with Kimberly Chen, who is the Director of Pharmacy for North Country Healthcare. As part of her work with North Country, Kimberly chairs the Arizona Alliance of Community Health Centers Pharmacy Peer Group and has been instrumental in guiding Arizona community health center programs and 340B program compliance and understanding. Since starting there, the health center has leveraged 340B savings to place pharmacists outside of the dispensing pharmacy and embedding them within the clinic setting as part of the integrated care team. Most recently, she has been actively involved in getting 340B legislation passed in the state of Arizona. Kimberly received her degree from the University of Cincinnati, James Winkle College of Pharmacy. Welcome, Kimberly. Next is Nick Ferreros, and I apologize in advance, like I said before, if I messed the name up. Um, I do what I can, but I am a surgeon, so we understand there's limitations there. Uh, he is a seasoned healthcare advocacy professional and has engaged in nearly every major recent health policy issue before Congress and regulatory agencies, including the Affordable Care Act, 340B drug pricing program, Medicare reimbursement policy, and more. He has worked closely with policymakers on Capitol Hill, the White House, the Department of Health and Human Services, the FDA, and the NIH. His work has appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, USA Today, CBS Evening News, National Public Radio, and other leading national news outlets. A native of Houston, Texas, Nick earned a bachelor's degree in political science from McGill University in Montreal, Canada. Welcome, Nick. I also want to welcome Robert Popovian, who is a recognized authority on health and economics, policy, government relations, medical affairs, and strategic planning. He has published extensively and referenced the impact of biopharmaceuticals and health policies on costs and clinical outcomes in the most prominent medical sources and media publications, including the Clinical Economics and Outcomes Research, The Oncologist, Journal of Vaccines and Vaccinations, Health Science Journal, USA Today, Washington Examiner, Managed Healthcare Executive, and The Hill. Dr. Popovian completed his doctorate in pharmacy and master of science in pharmaceutical economics and policy degrees at the University of Southern California with honors. He has also completed a residency in pharmacy practice, adult internal medicine and infectious diseases at the Los Angeles County USC Hospital and a fellowship in pharmaceutical economics and policy at USC. So welcome to all. 
Uh, I'm going to stop talking now and start asking some questions and let you guys take over if that's okay. So I'm going to start with really a broad one for the entire panel. You know, I gave a quick overview of what this program is, but what else do we need to know? We need to understand better the intent of this program, how it works. What are all of your thoughts on this? I can call you by name if you want, or you can jump right in. It's really, it's a free for all. Sure, maybe I can start. Um, uh, look, Russ, this is an ex extremely important program for uh, in the United States and something that we need to maintain long-term. And it really helps institutions like the one I was trained at, which is the LA County USC Medical Center. It's in South LA, uh, it's uh, in East LA actually, and it's in an impoverished community that had a lot of uh, uninsured patients. And this, this program really helps that institution to be able to provide care to patients. The problem is, Russ, as everything else in healthcare system, you know, this has become uh, what the original mission was has been abandoned. It's become a profit maximizing machine by insurers and pharmacy benefit management companies. And that's what the problem is. The, pro the original intent is not the issue. These institutions absolutely need the, this help. And they do use this, uh, this resources gained from this program to provide care for patients. It's what has, it has become is the problem. And that's what probably the policymakers need to tackle. Yeah, I would echo, I mean, absolutely what Dr. Popovian just said. I mean, institutions, FQHCs, like where Kimberly works are, are they need 340B and, and it must be preserved for that. Um, and something that people don't understand is, you know, the, the piggy bank doesn't keep growing. Like this, this balloon is not just gonna keep growing and growing and growing. And uh, Dr. Popovian mentioned uh, PBMs, they're the newest uh, bad actor in this. Um, you know, uh, something someone pointed out earlier today that I th thought was really interesting. We talk about 340B like it is the original program. This is what it was when it was created in 1992. And that is absolutely not what it is. It has mutated far beyond what it was originally intended to be by Congress. Um, and where we've ended up today is something that's frankly unsustainable. And the people that will be hurt at the end of the day are going to be the FQHCs, the, the Ryan Whites, the Black Lung Clinics that uh, rely on 340B savings to continue operations. Um, and we, you know, that's why we need an examination of it. Kimberly? Certainly. You know, I think both of you spoke very succinctly. I think what I would um, add is, you know, I have to do a lot of training on this to frontline folks, providers, and, and folks, and, and it's confusing. It's an incredibly complex program. So if we put it in layman's terms, it's to spread scarce federal resources. Well, how does that work, right? The way that it works is federal at covered entities like federally qualified health centers buy drugs cheaply so that we can pass those savings on. And what ends up happening is that savings is what's so far under attack um, by these pharmacy benefit managers and manufacturers. Um, and there's so many nuances to how these attacks are happening, but what, what gets lost is the impact to the patient. Um, and we have patients who can't ac access insulin. It's not even about how much the insulin costs, they, they can't get access to it because of these attacks. And, and, I, and I like to make sure that we keep that in mind because really ultimately this program is designed to help uninsured and underinsured populations get access to care. Um, and, it's, and it becomes so much, um, skewed in, in the environment that we're in. Um, and because of the complexity of the pro program, I see it so many times when I meet with legislators that it's too complex. So it, it, maybe we, we shouldn't go there right now. Um, and so we, we need to continue that advocacy efforts. And I think, uh, Ross, I think what Kimberly brings up is very important because this program would not be scrutinized as much if the ultimate payer in the marketplace, which by the way, the payer in the marketplace in the United States is not the insurer or the pharmacy benefit management company, is all of us, we open up our wallets to pay for healthcare services. It's employers who subsidize 50% of the healthcare. And to some extent is the government, although government uses our taxes to pay for the healthcare in the United States. So in other words, if the benefits go directly to the ultimate payer in the healthcare system, I don't think we will have as much of an angst, but because of this middle men that have intervened in this thing. And you see this, I mean, the largest 
contract pharmacy in this country is CVS Caremark, uh, and now Aetna, basically. It's a large insurer in PBM that benefits from this program. So because of this intervention, the ultimate payers in this uh, ecosystem that we have in the United States, the healthcare system, the patient or the employer are not getting the full benefits. And in fact, they're probably creating incentives in the marketplace that they're overpaying at times because of this type of, uh, that we, we don't have a good handle of what's going on with this program. So that actually leads me to, to my next question, though. I will say again, I always want to be uh, show conflict of interest or show bias. Uh, many of the people who are attending know I work at the Safety Net Hospital in Phoenix. So this obviously I have a very you know vested interest in understanding and knowing how this program works with my patient population. So first, thank you all for continuing to provide this input. But let's get into that a little bit. You you all mentioned some of the ways how this is mutated and kind of the issues. So what is the regulatory landscape then? If all these things have mutated out and we're having these problems, who has oversight? How does this work right now? And where are those issues? Because again, why are we going the way we are then if there's supposed to be regulatory oversight? I only ask easy questions as you can <laughs> Well, that's the problem, Ross. There, there really isn't very rigorous oversight. Again, the, the, the good actors, the FQHCs and the grantees have very stringent transparency and reporting requirements and are held accountable um, for their use of this. But the others uh, over the years, the, the, the growing hospital sector that is, has that is taken, taken it over um, don't really have that. And I think that's when you're in Washington, when you're talking, you know, with the think tanks and the talking heads and the wonks, uh, we we tend to always say transparency and accountability. Very simple. We don't, you know, it's not kill the program, not burn it down. It's let us understand where what's happening with it. Where exactly. where are the dollars going? Um, and there are a lot of dollars going into it. I think the last estimate I read about 2026 is going to be the largest federal drug program in the United States, bigger than Medicare and Medicaid. And that is, I mean, if that isn't a shocking wake up call to everybody that we really need to understand, you know, we know where all the dollars go in plenty of other places within our healthcare system, but this is a black box. It's we need this money. We need these uh, 30 to 60% discounts. And trust us, we know what we're doing with it. We're, it's not that glass tower. It's not, you know, it's not the, the uh, bonuses. And again, I'm not saying that about all actors. There are plenty of very ne needy organizations within 340B that require this. But at a certain point, one bad apple is going to ruin the whole bunch. And uh, we just need, we need a little bit of sunshine into this program. You know, my, my policy, I mean, HRSA technically is the institution within DC that oversees this program, but my gripe has always been, uh, why can't we change the definition from institution to individual, where the discount really follows the individual? And that way we'll resolve all the issues because if the patient qualifies for this type of a discount, they should absolutely get it. But what we know now is that it's not even the institutions, it's not the hospital system, it's not the organization that you work at, Russ, or where Kimberly works at. It's primarily the for-profit pharmacies <laughs> that have taken over and the, PB, which, and the PBMs that own these pharmacies and they're uh, raking in the dollar amounts. And you see the exponential increase in the number of pharmacies in the last 10 years since the expansion of the Medicaid program through ACA. And that's the, that's the troubling part, that there is no accountability in that space. And I, I agree with Nick. I think what required to start off with, we just need transparency to see where the money flow goes. And if we know that the money flow goes and it goes to institutions that help patients and that goes to charitable care and to help for the uninsured, uh, like the uh, individuals that you and uh, Kimberly serve, then that's fine. But if it's going to profiteering by, you know, for-profit pharmacies, that's a problem because then it's not being utilized appropriately and it's creating other issues in the marketplace. Because at the end of the day, if the pharma company is giving certain amount of discounts in this one place, they're going to increase prices for this other entity, which is primarily the private sector, which is the employers and the patients in the commercial plans and everything else. So somebody is going to end up paying for it. And it's an unfortunate distribution. So in my opinion, it should follow the individual and we should have complete transparency. 
I think um, you brought up a, a valid point. So oversight is by first step, right? So they're the ones that wrote the regulation. The problem that we see in the regulatory landscape is that HRSA is not empowered to enforce or um, in, you know, and that's why things are playing out in the court system as we see it right now is that HRSA, you know, four, five years ago, they tried, there was a, a bill that was, didn't make it all the way. It was, you know, many, many refer to it as the mega guidance or the, the omnibus guidance that was supposed to give more, um, reinforcement power essentially to HRSA to be able to um, start to engage the, the attacks that we were seeing on the program from the PBMs, the pharmacy benefit managers and the insurers. And so uh, because HRSA doesn't have that enforcement capability of this regulation and can only provide guidance and papers and, and that sort of thing, we're starting to see some of these things have to play out in the court system, which is truly probably not the ideal place to see these these things play out. And I think that the perspective of it being for, to the individual is very interesting. I think um, I would probably respectfully disagree just a little bit, only knowing how we leverage our savings, that if we were only able to give it to um, specifically to that patient, the, the profits that we use to leverage to, to help sustain um, otherwise unsustainable programs like dental care and um, care management services and, and you know really impacting um, outcomes could be more challenging, right? While I agree that it would help the individuals, it could um, disrupt how systems like federally qualified healthcare centers are working. And to go back to Nick, I would not disagree with you that there are many bad actors. And, and I would agree that we, uh, as federally qualified healthcare centers, um, black lung, HIV, hemophilia centers, really are, are rigidly um, adhering because we have so much tied to that. We could lose our federally qualified status if we're not compliant. But last numbers I saw, um, we're, we only account for about four to four to eight percent of the overall dollar spend of the 340B program, which means while we are probably some of the most engaged with the 340B program, our voices are small, and we're coming to conflicts in the legislative landscape where some states are starting to pass legislation that actually tease out the difference between those two entities. That poses its own problems because it it creates disunity amongst those who could work together to find solutions. Um, I understand why it happens, right? Because it's easy to say, hey, these groups are doing really well and so we can um, protect them. Um, but it does create a, a lack of harmony for us to be able to address the overall issues of, of where are the dollars flowing to and the transparency because it really does need to be there. I, I agree there, you know, we're not talking about small dollar amounts and so, Programs need to be able to account for where they are going. And, and I'm grateful to be able to say myself and my peers of, of other uh, pharmacy directors in Arizona could do that in a heartbeat. <laughs> We've got our elevator speeches. I could tell you what programs, I could tell you dollar amounts because this program is so important. Um, we eat, sleep it, and breathe this and, and is why we engaged in legislation for Arizona this year um, to try to protect some of that program. This is all great info. And actually, I want to touch on something you just said, Kimberly, not this is for the entire group. You, know, you just mentioned a couple of times on, uh, about litigation. So I'm curious about what are you aware of any ongoing litigation that you or your organizations are a party to or others that could impact this program? Obviously, it doesn't sound like going to the courts is the ideal way to solve these issues, but that is happening. So what are we seeing right now regarding these lawsuits that are being filed? How is that going to affect things? Who's involved with them exactly? Here's if, we can, if anyone can provide any more detail about those. The 800-pound gorilla in the room is the uh, Supreme Court decision last week um, that came down. Uh, that was the uh, is basically essentially the, the manufacturers uh, who did not want to do pass through of 340B savings to contract pharmacies, which are the uh, for-profit PBMs that are taking over this program. Um, and uh, you know, kind of to Kimberly's point, you got to be careful what you wish for because. That could be a Peric victory here um, in that it's a very narrow opinion and essentially what it said, and, and I'm not a lawyer, so I'm paraphrasing here, but essentially what it said was that for 2018 and 2019, CMS did not do a census of 340B savings and, and use those uh, to make this decision. Of course, CMS did do a census for 2020 and 2021, and that census came up with a higher spread um, on 340B savings. So depending on the appetite for the current administration and CMS, they could turn around and say, 
hey, that's, you know what, you're right, courts, we're, we're going to, we're going to use our census data, and it will be, it was, it was, it would be a higher uh, ASP minus 28.7 is what they found in their, their latest census. So it could be a bigger cut. And uh, one other little fact is that um, the, the, because of the way those, the, that cut was implemented a few years back, it was budget neutral. And so the savings had to come be were spread out across all hospitals. So now you're going to see a food fight between the true safety nets and these and the you know I say air quote safety net providers out there to try claw back those billions of dollars in savings. And we don't know how that's going to. I have no clue how that will play out, but it'd be very interesting to watch. And unfortunately, some very deserving hospitals will end up losing because. We did an analysis on that when when those that cut was originally implemented, and it showed those savings would benefit the rural providers uh, significantly. Yeah, and Russ, let me make it clear. I think Nick touched on it. I think the litigation uh, and the litigation that will continue has to do with the contract pharmacies. It has nothing to do with the institutions. Uh, this is not. I mean, look on the surface. Um, I'm sure there's a need for some contract pharmacies to exist. But when you have, you know, instead of Arizona, about 30, 35% of them are outside the state of these contract pharmacies. And majority of them are either with for-profit chain drugstores. It's a problem that needs to be addressed. And I think litigation will continue because that, that, that issue has not been resolved yet uh, of the growth, the exponential growth. And, you know, and the most recent thing, I mean, it came out of JAMA, a couple of researchers looked at this issue of 340B, and they, the conclusion was that the contract pharmacy growth really in the United States was in affluent neighborhoods that are primarily white versus there's a reduction actually in contract pharmacies in Latino and black neighborhoods. Uh, so poor people are not benefiting from this. And I'll give you one example, like UCLA, which by, by the way, my daughter attends, uh, medical center, they have no contract pharmacies in the city of Compton or in the district of Watts, which are the two, the area that I trained, I went, I actually worked in those neighborhoods. And those are one of the most impoverished neighborhoods in Los Angeles. So, and why does UCLA have all these contract pharmacies out of state? Nobody can explain. And I think I'm probably gonna have a little bit of a contrarian opinion there for, for, um, for that. And I agree, contract pharmacies are in litigation. They're probably going to be there for a while, but the benefit of the contract pharmacy environment, um, I would strongly disagree with to the patients. I, I don't disagree that there are areas that are, are not utilizing well. I recognize that there's bad actors that um, are not utilizing contract pharmacies. But let's talk Arizona. North Country Healthcare serves all of Northern Arizona from the New Mexico border to the, to the California border. We're across 500 or 700 miles. And we only have three pharmacies, one in, one in Flagstaff, one in Grand Canyon, one in Kingman. So when my patients at Holbrook or Sholo or Round Valley need to have access to medications, if they want access to sliding fee scale medications, which means they're 200% below the poverty level or lower, they would have to drive to Flagstaff to get their medication. And let's not even talk about the cost of gas and, and the ability for them to have the transportation or the time to do that. Who can drive three to five hours one way to get their insulin? And so without contract pharmacies, our patients don't have access to medications. And, and is it being abused? It's likely. But I can also tell you that without putting some of those contract pharmacies for our eligible patients in those affluent neighborhoods, the program also doesn't work, right? So the idea is that three court 40 B facilities pay for drugs here where standard entities pay for drugs at a higher cost, right? So the margin, we all get reimbursed at the same space. The reimbursement is better for a 340B facility. If we only utilize contract pharmacy for our patients who can't afford their medications, then we don't have that savings to leverage supporting how we can then subsidize making those medications affordable for lower, lower entity or lower cost individuals. So you, you do need that, that balance for folks who are eligible for the program, right? So it means in a, in a, just to contextualize it, what does that mean for a primary care facility safety net like North Country? They have to be seen at the facility within a year. 
by one of our providers. Our provider has to see them in the brick and mortar or via telehealth, and we have to write a prescription subsequent to that. And it has to go to one of our pharmacies that we have registered um, um, on the, the data, the 340B database, right? So it is, a, it is a narrow population. I can't pick up patients in a neighborhood that aren't using our services. We see patients across all demographics from uninsured immigrants, non-US citizens, all the way up to you know, those who are very affluent. But if you don't have that balance, we still struggle to make those services eligible um, and accessible for our patients because we write off millions and millions of dollars to those low cost individuals. It, Steve, this is this is the, the this is the big picture problem with 340B. Kimberly, you do it right. You you need those savings. The system works for you, and but it's it's in many other settings it doesn't. And I can give the perfect example of one of our doctors who works in Austin, Texas. She's an oncologist uh, with Texas Oncology, um, and uh, she will see a patient like every good oncologist. She has admitting privileges with all the hospitals in the city. Um, she will see a patient at her practice. That patient has is being treated at her practice exclusively. It's not hospital based. It's not hospital related. And after the fact, the ad hoc, the post hoc adjudication that the 340B pharmacies will do, they will write to her practice and say, "This patient is considered a 340B patient. This patient has touched a hospital at one point. I mean, all of us touch a local hospital in some way, shape, or form of our lives, especially cancer patients." And they'll say, we're going to take this claim and, and it's, we're going to mark it as a 340B claim. That patient wasn't seen in the, in the brick and mortar institution. The physician is not employed or working at that hospital. Nothing, none of the treatment was delivered in that hospital. And yet it is getting captured by 340B. And the, the organizations that are doing those capturings are some of the largest organizations in this country. I mean, CVS, the, Robert pointed out CVS Health. That is the number four, Fortune Four, not Fortune 400, Fortune 40, Fortune Four corporation in this country. And it's not based on the corner store that you have around, you know, down the street from you that sells, you know, deodorant. It's because of the PBM that they have affiliated with it. And these PBMs are they, they took 2.58 billion estimate out of the 340B system as contract pharmacies last year. That has a lot of money. I mean, imagine what. 2.58 billion spread across all the FQHCs in this country could do. And, um, and, and that's the problem is, uh, is that they, 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 are, they have sort of slowly taken, grappled in. And it was one thing at one point uh, where hospitals could claim, okay, we need this to stretch scarce resources and, and we do this and we do that. What is a PBM doing that is providing any care that deserves that 2.58 billion? And um, and that's what that's what we know. Of. That's not, there's not even any transparency there. So um, and sorry for the rant, but it, it's you know you are doing it so right, and I I want I want more. And I want I want the system to work for you, not these large these large entities. And I wholeheartedly uh, agree. <laughs> so I think I want to say the same thing. It's Kimberly provided an example that is absolutely correct. Why we need contract pharmacies, and I live in Virginia. So I'm in the DMV area. So Maryland, District of Columbia and Virginia, I could see why you would need contract pharmacies in all three states because people live within that vicinity. But if you look at the contract pharmacies like in Arizona, there's contract pharmacies in Puerto Rico and Maine and other states that have qualified due to Arizona's institutions. That's the question I have. I have no problem with what she explained and why we need the contract pharmacies and geographies to be able to like sort of help the Arizona patient. But it just doesn't make sense to me why 400 and some odd number of pharmacies are outside the boundaries of Arizona as a state. That well, and I can sense. give you some perspective on that. It has to do with sure. the PBMs, right? So, and, that, and, <laughs> and, and let's not get into the whole idea that PBMs okay. and pharmacies can be owned by the same corporation because you know, I've been in pharmacy for 30 years and seen that, and, and that's a lot of the problems, right? But we have patients who, even with Medicaid, are told you have to use these pharmacies um, because you're part of our network. And, and I don't care that you live in Arizona, you're going to get your meds shipped out of um, Tennessee or, you know, like you said, even some of these um, other, you know, not even in within the, the 50 states. 
Um, and right. so it, it creates so much, so much problem. I think what's exciting uh, as we get back to sort of the original question that Ross asked about legislation is last week, Arizona passed SB 1176. It was signed into law by Governor Ducey, and that is an anti-discrimination law that will protect Arizona uh, federally qualified health centers and other safety net organizations from discrimination on contracting for um, based on the, the, the status of being 340B because what we see currently, I cannot speak to the hospital side of things. I, I, don't, I don't know how their contracting works, but I can tell you what I see. And I get contracts from PBMs that say, here's your rate of reimbursement. And then there's an addendum that says, if you're a 340B facility, we're gonna pay you far, far less because part of that revenue needs to come to us. And as you can speak to, it, it doesn't go back to who it should. As a matter of fact, we were in a conversation with a PBM saying, you can't do this to us. And they said, well, we're doing this on behalf of, of the, the, insur the employer. The money's going back to them. Oh, please. Met with that employer <laughs> afterwards. And they said, the we have no idea what you're talking about, which was not surprising to any of us, right? But to call them on the carpet and say, you, you really have no leg to stand on here. Your, 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 you know, your client, the employer is not seeing these, these savings. This is not, has nothing to do and is not being driven by them. As you claim that your hands are tied, you're just taking money from those who are trying to help. Um, and, and that's part of the problem, right? We've got the government and then the safety nets on either end for not-for-profit. And in the middle are all of these for-profit entities wanting a bigger piece of the pie. And that's what's really causing so much harm. So, so we've heard the good way to do it, the not so good way to do it, uh, some potential beginning in Arizona, at least how to approach it. So I'm going to take advantage of all the experience and brain power on this panel. And now I'm going to ask you, let's, let's do future talk. Let's do solutions. All right. So we've now identified the problems. How do we fix it? We've said HRSA is nice for information, but doesn't really provide. We've got these PBMs that are causing issues. I've got medication coming from Maine, coming to Arizona. So where do we start? How do we attack this? Not just, and I'll say in different levels, let's start with how do we attack it locally? How do we attack it statewide? How do we attack it federally? Because we know those are going to require different strategies and different approaches. We all have that experience, right? You know, what's good on one level won't work in another. So I'm going to open that up and let you guys kind of let, let me, let me hear what you have to think on that. Let me talk about the macro level because this is no different. So I, my expertise is in drug pricing and spending. It's not 340B. 340B is just a micro level issue of this whole problem we have in this country, which I call everybody's hand is in the cookie jar, right? Of the drug pricing. Everybody makes profit. So um, this is no different than what we see with rebate contracting what we see with uh, uh, spread pricing on the generics, which I'm sure you saw uh, Annals of Internal Medicine just published another study showing that if the Medicare program had used Mark Cuban's pricing of his pharmacy pricing, he, they would have saved billions of dollars on the Medicare system. Same thing that Costco study came out in JAMA last year showed the same exact thing. Over a two year period, Medicare would have saved $4.5 billion if they just paid Costco cash prices instead of reimbursing on the, through the PBM model. So this is, again, Russ, going to margins. It's a margin play. It's just like the rebates are a margin play, spread pricing, so is 340B. What I tell state legislators is first and foremost is that we need data to, to stand up and say what the problem is. With that comes an issue of transparency. We need complete transparency in the system, whether it's rebate contracting, whether it's spread pricing or whether it's the 340B program, then we'll know where the money flow is and then we'll know who the culprits are that are taking advantage of the system. And that's when we need to then institute policies that are really going to fix the model overall. So let me just, because you mentioned transparency, we've said that a few times here. So do we have to do that through legislation? Do we do that through regulation? Do we have to wait to try, because look, let, let us be honest, the political and legislative environment we're in right now is not the smoothest one to get through. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I will steal a line from a good friend of mine that always has reminded me that, you know, even like odd number of years are about policy and even number of years are about politics. So how do we at this time, if we need to do that, do we have to go through the legislation route to get transparency or are there other ways we can kind of enact that happening and, and not wait for a, a bill to get through a very contentious legislature? So my background is government affairs, so I can 
tell you there is the federal Grassley bill that is right now that's going to start unraveling some and create some transparency in the marketplace. I'm more hopeful what FPC is doing is actually going to even go further and really look into this issue. So we have two government agencies. One is an agency and the other one is obviously legislators that are trying to fix the problem. But I always go back to my roots, which is the state level. It has, if it happens on the state level, it will put pressure on the federal government to act. We need to start in the state. We need to start legislative process in the state to shed light on where the money flow is going. And that would be the simplest way and the quickest way of doing it while we wait for the legislation and FTC on the federal level to come to yeah. I would I would agree. Um, you know, whenever I, I give presentations um, to a lot of state societies, and my first slide is always that Washington is focused on 60 other areas. You know, you've got the Supreme Court, you've got gun, gun, gun regulation. Um, so it's very challenging. And we, we you know, you, we've seen it every politician has run on lowering health care costs. And there's been very meaning, very little meaningful change uh, in the last decade in that regard. Um, uh, that said, you know, Robert did talk about the uh, Grassley Cantwell Senate bill, um, but it, it made it out of committee today. Um, yeah. So that's hopeful. It's also bipartisan. And I will say in the last year, it is for those of us that have been screaming from the mountaintops about PBMs, it is one of the, it's a very cathartic year to watch uh, bipartisan action in Congress um, on PBMs and regulating them. And, you know, there's a very, hot, very high likelihood that Congress is going to flip next year. Um, and I'll tell you, every conversation we have with the Republicans is they are, they are coming for PBMs and they're gunning for it. Um, but, you know, to your original question, Ross, you know, legislative or regulatory, I think you know, there is no silver bullet. It's their silver buckshot, right? There's, we got we to gotta do, you know, a million different things out there. Um, and uh, I think the FTC uh, investigation is absolutely key. Um, also, the, the CMS 340B hospital cut that just got the Supreme Court ruling on, that was done through regulation, not done through, poly, through legislation. So um, there, there is, you never know. Uh, what, it depends on what appetite there is right now. Uh, states, but states are definitely where it's at. Um, we are tracking tr a significant amount of bills. Kimberly already talked about the 340B bill that in Arizona, um, but it's more sort of broad PBM reform and and transparency and regulation and licensing and, and all the, the sort of things that we are starting to wake up and realize are broken about the system. Um, we at COA, uh, we recently uh, staffed up on the state policy side, and it's become a very big focus of ours because we have members across the country pushing, uh, pushing for things. And um, you know, we are now tracking 350 plus pieces of legislation. Of course, you know, it's like any other place, half of that's going nowhere. But um, but you're, it's very hopeful what, that what you're seeing with PBM reform in the in the states. And I will say. The thing about 340B is it sort of crosses all over the place. It crosses PBM reform, it crosses the hospital and site of service, um, but it also crosses into white and brown bagging. Um, and you know, if you want to know why PBMs are so long, have such the vested long game in 340B, in addition to the margin play that Roberts talked about, is it's they, they want to they want to own the channel, and they are they are working on they they don't they don't just control the formulary. And the reimbursement. They also want to control where people can get their drug, and uh, the all everyone who's watching this, um, who may be from a 340B hospital institution that's you know riding the gravy train right now, rightly or wrongly. Again, I want to say there are plenty of good actors out there, but who's writing it? Like when this implodes, uh, it may not implode. Also, from the from a federal level, it may end up being the PBMs coming in and saying, you know what, we're going to now white bag everything at our own Optum owned physician infusion centers, and you you know that that large margin that you were expecting to get from your cancer drugs is gone now. And good luck renegotiating with us. As Kimberly said, they're not exactly uh, easy to negotiate with, um, and they constantly will hide behind the plan sponsors just like the large 340B associations will hide between behind the FQHCs. Like everybody puts up the sort of their best defenses when it comes to reform and, and try trends to F change this. But, um, you know, there is, there are a lot of forces at play here. 
So we have our work cut out for us, is what, is what I'm hearing. Yeah, a little. But, yeah, that's okay but, uh, but, but Russ, I think there's hope, right? Because FTC, it was a bipartisan vote. It was a 5 0 vote. Republicans and Democrats voted to look at this issue. And the important comment that the FTC director made prior to the vote was that this was the first time that two disparate groups, pharmaceutical industry and the pharmacists and the pharmacies came together who were basically suing each other over the years, right? There's been litigation between those entities and we're complaining about the same party that was taking money out of the system to the detriment of patients. And as soon as they started looking at DIR fees and what patient out-of-pocket cost was, that's when they got the bipartisan vote to look at the issue. So, so let's a little get a more local since, you know, obviously we're ARMA. Uh, Kimberly, can you give us, a, you talked about, you know, a little bit of that process you went through of helping get that legislation passed. Can you give us a little broader window of exactly what issues we're facing within the state regarding maybe some of those bad actors or some of those that maybe don't want to see this be this legislation you talk about be successful? Like what barriers are we going to run into and what should we be watching out for moving forward to make all these changes occur in our state? As we, know, we can have an influence now in our state. How do we go about doing that? Since you have experience, please uh, jump on in. Thank you. I, you know, I think some may have more, more to say on this. I won't claim to have great extensive legislative knowledge. It has been quite a crash course for us this year as we tried to, to get this legislation into place. Obviously, one of the first um, things that we foresee is, is actually the, um, the enforcement and the enactment, right? So we have a law that says you can't discriminate contractually, and we already have discriminatory contracts in place. And so we, we cross our fingers and hope that by the, the enactment date of 2024, those contracts are, are rolled back to where they should be. Um, but, you know, I, I'll tell you personally, and I can't speak for everyone who worked on this bill, you know, you sort of wonder, because ultimately we came to an agreement with all stakeholders that this bill would work. And so then you sort of say, well, wait, if I have the PBM saying this is okay, what what did we what what loophole did we not see right what did we not understand when when they are sort of like well we agree this is okay and this is good and, and we'll be we'll be on board um i think the biggest challenge that we face is that it you know pbms until we start to address them across the channels that nick talked about right the white bagging the brown bagging um all of the other aspects um it's so multifaceted that we can't just have an anti-discrimination bill and say, oh, it's all fixed. We can't, we, we can't be hurt anymore. And I think that um, it, there's so many, so many factors. When you start to bring the stakeholders to the table, you have the insurers, you have the PBMs, you have the hospitals whose contracting structure is vastly different um, than what you see for FQHCs that have pharmacy to um, PBM contracts as opposed to really complex situations. And so um, breaking it down to help folks understand, especially legislators, when we were going around and meeting, there were so many pharmacy related bills in the House and the Senate at the state level that we literally had a meeting with the legislators and they didn't know which bill we were talking about. They had it confused and had blended all of those bills together. and legitimately said, I don't know what we're talking about anymore. I don't even know where I stand because I can't remember what we're talking about. And so keeping it um, clear and simple, which is a program that is not, is, is going to be a real challenge. And, and we really, my personal opinion, I'm not speaking on behalf of any other organization, but what, what we're seeing in the FQHC space is how do we operate in a space where we're doing good but the dollars and the volume are on the hospital side and so we don't have the voice um, but our programs are under such tremendous attack and so how do we approach that in a, in a unified way where we don't have the ability to impact the change and and i think it, it goes to transparency we're full full happy to be transparent but that right now to some extent is is to our detriment because the call for transparency is let let PBM see everything that we get reimbursed so that they can carve those carve, figure out a way to get their hand in the pocket, right? So we want to be transparent on how the monies are spent. We want to be transparent on what programs we're supporting. But some of these um, mechanisms that are being proposed are either in, incredibly potentially damaging to us from a financial perspective or incredibly cumbersome in a system that is so strained with um, lack of providers and lack of staffing to put on some of these um, audit or uh, reporting uh, regulations to 
um, open up uh, transparency that's really intended for the hospital setting and, and our systems just can't can't sustain how to do those things. Pharmacy software in some scenarios not even designed to work that way. Um, so it requires technological changes even to be compliant. Um, I apologize, that was probably fairly rambling in my answer, but man, no, it's, it's not one answer. And, and so I hope that, that Nick or Robert might even be able to contribute even at the local perspective. Look, look Kimberly, having worked in state and federal policy, politics, legislative efforts, First of all, passing the passing a bill is not the end, right? It's actually there's more work to be done after the legislation passes, and sometimes we forget about that, and that's when other parties get in with the resources they have and they write the bills and implementation that they want it to be done. Just like you mentioned, if it, if the PBMs don't have a problem, there's a problem with that language. Um, I would say, for the minimum, what needs to happen, maybe. A simpler way of like looking at it is that let's start reporting charitable care by these organizations, right? Let's see where the money is going. If these institutions, because that's another thing, you know, some hospitals do a fabulous job. They get the 340 money and their charitable care has increased and has been maintained over the years since they've had, some of them have gone down. In fact, as their 340B uh, has increased. So maybe that's the starting point right? Let's see how much charitable care is CVS Caremark providing to patients that they deserve this type of program. And then compare it to your institution and other institutions within Arizona. So that's maybe the starting point is to report charitable uh, care numbers and how much money is being provided as charitable care in these institutions. And then we can do it. At least we'll have some basis to start the discussion. Yeah. You know, it's, as you said, it's just passing the law is just the beginning. Um, and I, I'll tell a little side story is, you know, federally, we passed uh, hospital price transparency starting in 2021. Um, good luck finding that information, right? Uh, we, uh, one, uh, one piece of research, and, and I don't want to steal a question from later, Ross, so I'll, I'm not going to get too far into it. But, you know, we did some research in September of last year, um, looking at 340B uh, safety net hospitals. So not the grantees, but just the hospitals and their compliance with that transparency reporting requirement. Um, and out of the, what is out of the 1,087, we only found somewhere like 150 actually had usable data, meaning following the letter of the law, all, reporting all of their negotiated prices, including drugs and services, um, and what discounts, and then also including uninsured cash paying prices. Um, so you're looking at, you know, 150 out of 1,000, um, and we're rerunning that data right now. We, it's actually gone down. It's 117. So, um, you know, who's, and we, I think it was just two weeks ago, we saw the first, since January of 2021, when this law came into effect, can you imagine if we didn't file our taxes for two years, how quickly they would come after us? Um, but somehow, you know, these, these hospitals are avoiding it, but we didn't see the first fines for non-compliance until two weeks ago. Um, and they were relatively small to two hospitals in Georgia. Um, so, you know, there is, there's still a lot of work to be done with just sort of meeting the letter of the law and things that's at the federal level. And then state level, we hear stories that we, we, we have, we have uh, in Tennessee, they passed a fantastic PBM accountability bill uh, two years ago. And still, they're having a lot of trouble with it, and they're they're trying to just figure out how they get enforcement done. So yeah. I think you're going to see the same thing uh, in Arizona, and that happens with every battle. Um, it's just the beginning, not the end. So let me let me. We actually only have a few minutes left. This has been a great discussion. So I'm going to end with trying to maybe ask this question. That's you know, as we have continued on. So we're talking about that we need to start forming. It sounds like we need to start forming these real partnerships to really address this. You mentioned one, Robert, before about the pharmaceuticals and the pharmacists actually like cooperating with one another, which again, and going back to about, yes, I always worry I, as a surgeon, I trust no one, right? So if someone's happy with something, I'm wondering why they're happy, um, right? With any type when you talk about legislation. So let me ask you all, you know, on a, as a final discussion point, uh, so we need to work together. Obviously, this is, we've, we've, uh, uh, identified a variety of problems that need to be addressed on a variety of levels. Not one group or one set of individuals is going to be able to take this on. So who should we be partnering with? How should we be creating a coalition, even of different mindsets to come together? Who should we be looking for to reach out to 
to work on this because this is going to be a, a group effort, right? So who really needs to be at the table to address these things that are going to understand and maybe agree, if I, if there, I can use that word, of the perspectives being presented today? Again, the easy, easy question. answer, yeah. Employ employers, you know, that self-insured employers. That that's who that's been the 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 best audience that we have found to, to enforce change. Um, if you look at the comments uh, that the Grassley Cantwell Senate bill um, got, you have a very wide diver. You have the pharmacists, you have the oncologists, you have patient groups, you have the, the grocery store. Uh, and food manufacturers, and you, why are they in there? You think it's because they're paying the, the they're paying the bills for their employees and covered lives uh, insurance. And you know that if I can give a little plug for that transparency report that we did last year, we then took it a step further that I didn't talk about, and we looked at cost to to uh, in various settings. So between a Medicare patient and a community oncology practice, a Medicare patient at 340B hospital and a commercial patient at a 340B hospital. Community practice, $7,000 in, in, total, in total sort of revenue after, after all the chart costs. Uh, Medicare patient, 340B hospital, it was, um, uh, it was $14,000. Commercial patient, $200,000. So the spread from 7,000 to 200,000 um, at one of these hospitals. And that, that $193,000 that the commercial payer is paying for that is exactly why employers care about this stuff. And they, beyond just 340B, the PBMs and transparency on all their contracting and, and spread price spreads that they're facing their site of service issues, um, they're, you know, they're the ones left holding the bag um, on a lot of this, in addition to what Robert said at the beginning, us as taxpayers. Um, but they are, they have the most skin in the game right now and the most ability as plan sponsors to affect change, I think. And, and they're the ones that are not engaging as much. So I agree with Nick. I think that's that, where we need to. So I would say pharmacists, patients, physicians, organizations like Kimberly that she represents, organizations that Nick represents. The pharmaceutical industry, but then most importantly, is employers are missing in that coalition that they need to come on because they're overpaying for these medicines. I can tell you for a fact they're overpaying for it. Now, how much it is? Nick brought up an example. That's just one example, but it happens every time. So, and ultimately the patient, because we are the ones who are opening our wallets and paying for it for everything in healthcare, besides employers. Kimberly, I don't know if you want to hit the last word. Anything else you want to add? Man, I think Nick and, and Robert um, spoke well on that. So I, I don't think that there's much to add. I think the biggest thing that I see from my perspective is just education in general and, and to those groups, because what happens is the program is so complex that it's easy to just say, I, I don't need to get involved. It's I'm not in a 340B practice right. or, you know, we're not self-insured or, you know, pick, pick the argument. And, and then the, then all of the misinformation, I mean, I, I had, was just at a conference recently and it was, we were discussing 340B and someone, one of the, the speaker put up a slide of all of the, the misinformation. We were testifying in our state legislator legislation and, um, the, the inaccuracies in our in our opponents' testimonies was was almost laughable because it was like this actually Medicaid is excluded from this. We're not trying to restructure Medicaid, and you know, and, and so just we don't we can't combat that right when people don't understand the program and in, in the intent and then how it works. Um, it's so easy to sway legislators or other opinions because there's no understanding of really what it is, and so someone who was wise said it so it must be true and and they they aren't necessarily there's not ill intent or maybe there is some some folks just don't understand it and speak speak poorly but to educate ourselves and, and then share that knowledge i think is really part of what at the at the grassroots level we need to do i mean i, I have people in my own organization that don't they feel like that 430 c thing how does that work right and, and so when people who are utilizing the program don't even understand it we obviously have a larger issue at hand if you go to the Arizona Chamber of Commerce, I guarantee you they have no idea about this or how it's affecting their bottom line. They assume that's a that's not their membership. They assume that it's somewhere else buried in some poor poor neighborhoods and people who provide care for poor patients.
Plus, you're on mute. Yeah, I just realized. I'm like, well, that's not that's, that's around a half of it. All right. Uh, all that, you know, Kimberly, Nick, Robert, thank you all for your time and your expertise and your insight. I think this has been a fantastic hour. Um, I'm glad we're recording it. I want to make, I have to go back and kind of try to dissect because there was a lot of information. And again, surgeons, so limited, you know, information can get in there every once in a while. But I thank all of you. I hope those who attended really appreciate it. Again, there's a ton of information to learn. I thank you all. And I thank everyone who, who signed in for this webinar. I hope, again, it was educational. We have some ideas and some issues that we have to address. I guess the one good thing is there's plenty of work to be done. Uh, yes. And with that, I th thank all of you again. And I will wish everyone a good day and we'll let everyone go. Thank you again. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye.